Yes, you can. So, all right. Is the microphone on? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, some technical difficulties, but there are still people coming in. All right, let's start. Welcome to the session No Logs Concurrency in SQL Server with focus on read operations. That's a huge, huge topic. I'm just going to pick out some subjects. My name is Andreas Walter, who has been in my session yesterday on SQL injection. Oh, quite a lot. All right. Thanks for your support. And again, for the others, I'm a Microsoft Certified Solutions Master for Data Platform based on SQL Server 2012. Um, at several conferences for the last couple of years, six years, I think it's now, um, based uh, specializing on data warehouse architecture, performance analysis, stuff like that. If you want to reach out to me, you have uh, several opportunities here, social media, email, and so on. So, quick, quick poll, the audience, you, who would consider himself a SQL developer? All right, that's about 70, 80% at least. Application developer, another 40%. And administrator, another 50% maybe. All right. So I assume you have some background uh, knowledge. You can read T-SQL because I will write or show T-SQL. And some of the basic concepts should be familiar like tables and indexes. All right, our agenda is uh, getting started with locking and blocking. Quick introduction, how, how it looks like. Starting actually with lock starvation prevention and some of the uh, usual concurrency problems which are being prevented by blocking. Then we're gonna have a look at lock escalation and then how we can get around being blocked with several methods. In the last part, I'm going to talk about 12.05, and 12.05 is, as you probably have seen a couple of times in your career, the deadlock. So deadlock, how to analysis, how to, how to catch and how to analyze uh, deadlocks, and in the end, also a quick overview on snapshot isolation. All right, so in general, you probably have learned somewhere in school, in university, uh, about ACID. Uh, what we're talking about here is isolation, the I in ACID. You want to isolate transactions from each other to make sure somebody is modifying something which some, uh, and nobody else at the same time can read <coughs> what's not committed yet. So let's start off with a small demo. So I have prepared a small database, locking demos. Nothing fancy in there yet. What we need is a small table, and I'm going to insert one data row, uh, the alpha row. That's all so far. So, this record I want to update in my current session. Uh, begin transaction, I'm going to write an update, change alpha to bravo based on the ID. And then I'm, I'm going to stay in my transaction and select what I just updated. So I can see, okay, I in my transaction already updated. Alpha is not anymore, it's Bravo now. So now I have a second session. And as you can guess, uh, it will try to read this very data row, actually the whole table. And it cannot read. The only thing I'm returning here is the session ID, just for our purposes, so we can analyze better. So it's being blocked. We see the executing query here. And we can also start at several tools that say using activity monitor, you can see that there's blocking going on. There's one session running and there's one session being suspended and the suspended reason is because of a lock um, in shared mode and we cannot get it because session 53 has it. And that's actually this one here. Yeah. This one is not doing anything right now. If you look in the details, we can probably see the last executed command in this case. All right, so that about activity monitor. Let me go and show it a little bit different. I've prepared a 
small watcher script, this one here. With this script, I'm going to do approximately the same that activity monitor does. So I will use DMVs to get the resources which are the, the transactions that are blocked, blocking transactions and the resources that are being uh, utilized. So by joining the system tran logs with system exit requests um, and always waiting tasks, I get this result. And this is basically the same as an activity monitor, just a little bit abbreviated because I'm only focusing on real object logs. I ignore everything else which is only sitting on a database and doing nothing. So if I look here, I see my session 53 being the head blocker, having an intended exclusive log on object table one, on a page, so on page ID one, 100, uh, on file ID one, the page 190, and a row ID which is also being blocked exclusively. And we see our waiting session, number 54, session two, uh, which is waiting for the RIT. RIT is row ID, uh, because we happen to have no cluster index here. All right, so that's with two sessions. If I add the third session, in this third session, I will actually do an update again. Yeah, let's just assume he has run his application, he has seen, oh, there was an, a, a data row with ID 1. Yeah, it's asynchronous, application has loaded in the, in, the UI, in the UI. So he has seen back in time that there was, has been an, an alpha record. And he wants to ch change alpha to Charlie, yeah, based on the ID himself. And of course, he again will be blocked. His session ID is the 57. So if you look in our watcher session, we will of course see that guy also. So we will see 57 is, is the, the new session coming in, which is waiting, this is now important, it's waiting for 54 and not for 53. Yeah, so it's in line, in order. So, and now let's bring in the fourth session. This fourth session will just do again a simple select, of course it will be blocked. What's more interesting is what it is waiting for. Again, the same query. So our last session, number 63, is waiting for session 54. So it looks like it jumped ahead in the queue, right? Because here should be a 57, that was the third session, yeah, waiting for 54. But now 63, doing a select, is also waiting on 54. So it looks like that our intent exclusive log here or our update log actually, um, which is a much harder log than just a shared log, which is the last one, is being um, passed by number 63. So those two up here are select queries. They are worth waiting for the very uh, top one. And this last select query kind of jumped ahead of the update query. So, if this would be real, if this would actually turn out that way, we might have a problem because in such a scenario, it can happen that, are, that the first log gets away. Let's say he will finally commit his uh, Bravo change. And then mid in the midst, many more selects are coming. Then it would happen that all the selects jump ahead of the second update and the update, the second update never gets a chance, right? That would be log starvation. And it appears that we have a problem here. Yeah? So actually in this pattern, it looks like SQL Server would sooner or later get into log starvation. Starvationing the guy who is trying to get an update because those select queries are um, equal to each other. Yeah? They're compatible. So it looks like they are, being, uh, they are passed on. Yeah? So that would be a problem. Funny thing is though, this is not reality. So let me go to session number one, if I find it, that one, and just do a rollback. So session one is now out of the game. Remember this was before, and now look again. We see the, la the 57 being, um, Hold on, 57 was the 
update the second one. Uh, let me see. 57 is this one here. Yeah. That in fact the 57 has been passed by the select viewers. It's still running, it's holding up its logs. So it has not committed yet. Yeah. Until I kill this guy out. So this has been is the case for the uh, cluster for without any index. If I now create an index on the very table, you know, let's just have a look. If I create an index inside the transaction, you have all a load and load of logs. Yeah, this is all the same session creating logs on si system objects. That's in fact important for later on. Right now, not so much. So let's just commit the create index and do the same again. <coughs> Actually, let me first check what we have now in our table. So we have alpha because we have rolled back everything. Okay, so begin transaction, try the same, just start with Charlie. And we go to number two, which is here, to number three, trying an update. And number four, doing another select. And now our watcher session. So what's the difference between uh, before and now? We have uh, no longer the read log, we have the key log because we have a clustered index and no row ID, but a pointer to the key. So the last one, 63, is again waiting for 54, jumped ahead. So let's see. 54. Okay, so now I'm gonna resolve number session one, session number one. We say commit again and run my script. And now I see in this case that actually not the second select has not passed the second update. So that's actually a difference. Yeah, and so it means in the case of the heap, the locking behavior in a chain is different than when you have a clustered index. Yeah. And actually, it's even more complicated because if you realize before that, this one has indeed waited for session number 54. So while resolving in the background, it actually has changed the order of the chain who is waiting for who. So what I saw first was not what happened now. I would have expected that again this number 63 would have jumped ahead before, because this was what was being shown in the DMV. But after resolving the locks, it will get pushed back behind in order behind the update. Yeah. So this is what makes um, analyzing locking and blocking really complicated because if you happen to have this situation, you may think, well, that's the reason why it happens, but actually it does not do what it looks like. Yeah. Should be aware of that. All right. So if I now resolve the third session, of course, then the select will also go through. Go through. Let's just do that. Roll back transaction. And if you watch the blockings now, it's also uh, the select is not blocked. All right. So this is blocking and blocking in a real short overview. This already the first little trick to it, yeah, lock starvation prevention. So in the second case, it has really prevented the starvation problem. All right. So what kind of concurrency problems are we actually trying to solve by locking? Yeah? So locking is not to, to annoy us, it actually makes sense. Yeah? because otherwise you would have dirty reads all over the place. Dirty reads meaning you read data which is not being committed. It's in the midst of a transaction. Uh, missing and double reads, another uh, effect that can happen that you read uh, certain rows several times in the same transaction. And if you make budget planning or whatever, if you make calculations of any kind with sums or average over the whole uh, record set, you may have a big, big, uh, um, shift between reality and what's, what you read, because you read doubled, and that just depends which rows you read double. Yeah? Let's say you have 100 entries and one of them is 1 million, the other ones are really small, small and you read the 1 million twice, yeah? you have 
a real uh, problem in your numbers in the end. And the other way is, of course, also to yeah, missing reads. You just never catch a certain row. Yeah. Similar to that, a little bit is the lost updates and the non repeatable read. Lost update, yeah, when somebody is updating it and the last one um, is not being warned, warned that, he, uh, the first, that the loser is not being warned when he, his record is being updated again by the other session. And non repeatable read is not inside one transaction necessarily, it can be just many transactions which do not read the same again. And so on. So if you look at this in the overview, we see actually our standard isolation level read committed is not totally perfect at all, right? So dirty reads are prevented, uh, probably the most known um, phenomena. But lost updates, non-repeatable reads, even phantom reads, this all can even happen in read committed. Now it can happen that you read something, then read again, and there uh, something has changed. Yeah? If you don't want that, you have to um, go one step further, go to repeatable read, as the name says. If you read multiple times, you always get the same. But it also means that in between this record set, nobody else can change anything. Yeah? So you're blocking, so the reader is blocking the writers for a much longer period. And serializable, it's basically like queue up behind me. When I'm done with one my work, you can go ahead. Yeah? No problems at all in terms of phenomena, but of course a big impact on performance. So new, a new part that we got in SQL Server 20, uh, 2005 was snapshot isolation in, isolation in two flavors. Yeah? And both prevent dirty reads and the snapshot isolation itself also prevents lost updates, non-repeatable reads, and phantom reads based on the optimistic concurrency model. And so you always get the previous row. So this kind of quick overview, you usually work in read committed, of course. All right, so one thing to remember is the more you go up, the more you isolate your session, yeah, the more you're serializing, and the more blocking is going on. Yeah? All right. So we have seen in our uh, first demo that there were different kinds of blocks. We saw the update block for the updates going on. Also we saw something like IU for intent update, IX for intent exclusive lock, and of course the S lock, shared lock um, for our simple selects. In this schema you can easily, I'm just kidding, uh, find out which ones are compatible with other ones. So this is the complete uh, lock compatibility matrix. If you look at an abbreviated version, uh, it makes it a little bit more easy to read. We had an update lock at one row, let's say. Yeah. And this update lock would be uh, compatible with a shared lock, but it would of course not be compatible with another update lock at the same time. Yeah. So the other way around, exclusive locks are not compatible with anything. Nobody can get anywhere where have, we have an exclusive lock. Intent exclusive usually happens at the page level. Yeah, there you can have an intent shared lock at least. Or queued up some more intent exclusive ones. And then the shared one is the, the most soft mode, let's say. Yeah, or intent, actually the intent shared, which are of course compatible. So the, res the resources that we can block or lock are starting from top, the databases. So anytime you have a database uh, access, you know, just use database. In that moment, you already have a lock on a database. It's a shared lock. Uh, the only effect when you ever see it is usually when you try to drop the database. You cannot drop a database as long as there's a, as there's a session on it. Stuff like that, usually it doesn't have effect. Yeah? But then down to the object could be a table, page of the table, keys of the table, or row ID of the table. Later on we will part partitioning and other stuff like metadata and the extents and files and so on can also be blocked. And then there are subtypes to it. So what we saw was, was like object, page, and key, and read log. I filtered out the database logs which were definitely in the background also. All right, so how can we get around this nasty blocking? Yeah? Let's see how we could do that. All 
I hope this was clear, let me make it again. Yeah, we're trying to access a page. There are certain ways to do that. Just the brutal method, and which one is the brutal method? The brutal method is the no log table hint, just give it to me. Yeah, whatever condition it is right now, give me the data. Uh, it's actually the same as saying read uncommitted. It just sounds like it's not so hard, but it's actually exactly the same. Yeah? Give me uncommitted data. Uh, that's the transaction level behind it. Yeah? So in this case, uh, everybody knows you can have false or missing updates. That's the dirty read. But what's not so much known is that you can actually read data twice or more, multiple more times or never get to a certain row at all if it's being updated in the background. And this depends what's actually happening. The problem is the more uh, locking and blocking, or let's start, let's go back a little bit, the more um, transactions you have against this table, like crude transaction, changing data, updating data, and inserting and deleting, the more of this stuff you have going on against the table, the more blocking you have, the more you are tempted to do a no lock, but also, at the same time, the more of this is going on, the more of those problems will actually occur. Yeah? The, the more inserts and deletes happen at the same time, the, more, the higher the chances are that you get missing data or double, rate, double um, reads for the data when you try to run your report, maybe, for example, with a no-log table hint. Yeah? So, not only you can have uh, not the correct data, but also doubled yeah? certain rows, not the whole record set but certain data. All right. So the other option would be also, well, we don't want to be blocked yeah, forever for 30 seconds, whatever the application timeout is. Yeah, we change our timeout. And that's the, the keyword. We just say we want to set our timeout in this transaction. Yeah? If we have to wait for this table, let's say it's a transaction table where some, somebody uh, is inserting rows for setting stuff, so on. We don't want to wait. If you're being blocked, just, just give an, us an information and we do something else. And we have the read past hint. Yeah. Okay, there is a block. Ignore this row and get me the next row. Yeah. So let me show you those three variations or possibilities of getting around blocking. So, let me just show you a small table that I have prepared, yeah, consisting of three rows, not really interesting, some numbers in it. And I will create a blocking session in a new, a new window here. This blocking session will start a transaction. Let me remove this for better reading. Actually, we may need that one. So, begin transaction, update our table, change some of the data of one certain row. Yeah? Not update the whole data table, just one row in this case. So if we now watch our, or check our watcher session, we see the uh, blocks that are being created, key logs and page logs, and of course the table itself. And now we go to our um, reading session, and we'll set the lock timeout to three seconds in this case. Uh, 3,000 milliseconds. Select from our data table. So we have to wait. We are being blocked. He realizes that. But we don't have to wait so long. We get a timeout much quicker. Uh, can be useful. If I check this session, we see this our chain shared lock waiting, but at the maximum for three seconds. Uh, this is one possibility. So we're not really circumventing the block itself, but we are not letting the user wait so long yeah, until in the end we will say, well, there is nothing we can do for you. We just make it a little bit quicker. So that's one version. The other one way would be, of course, the famous or infamous no log, or it's actually the same as if I would say set transaction isolation level read uncommitted. Behaves exactly the same, no difference. Let me do this one. As you can see, our update statement in the background, which updated row number 100, row, no, row ID 100 does not exist anymore. Uh, there is a gap. But it happens to be in first position because I changed it to minus 100. If I would have changed it to plus 300, of course I would not see it at all because it's already, uh, it's right now in this stage of being updated. So we see it. 
but in a different position because I have just said uh, less than 200. So, and the third version is working with read past, same query otherwise. So, no waiting at all. If you scroll down to row 100, or where we assume row 100 would be, there is no one who will row 100 again. Yeah, but we don't see the updated status, we just jump over it. Yeah, so there was a key lock, and this one row we don't see, don't uh, wait for, we just read the next key. Yeah, it depends uh, on the indexing that you have. You can, it can also happen that you have to skip multiple rows, but in this case we just we skip one row. So that's all quite possible. Um, two things to, to be mindful here. The timeout itself, it's just the error that happens once you hit the reach the timeout. We saw this uh, after three seconds, the one, two, two, two. It does not roll back my blocked session. Yeah, I'm being blocked, I'm being timeouted, but it does not roll back whatever I have done. If I want a rollback to happen inside, inside this procedure, where this timeout occurred, I have to ask for this error and whatever I want to do now, I do a rollback or I do something else. But don't assume that just because you got an error that you can uh, kill your connection or whatever and nothing has happened. No, if you have opened in this transaction, in this reading transaction, maybe before I've also done an update, this block is still there or this lock is still there, blocking others yeah, until, until you really resolve your um, timed out session. So it's that's what I mean by no auto ray rollback. It's not like a primary key uh, error. The read past, I know anybody have, has used the read past hint? Two, three people? Okay. Usually I would, would expect it only to be used in queuing systems yeah, when you just want one row and then do something if this row, row is already being processed by somebody else, get me the next row. It's not really advisable to use for reporting stuff because you never know how much you actually are jumping over and how much data you're skipping. You don't know that. Yeah. Can be a lot of rows, can only be a single row uh, or nothing at all. You never, there is no, you cannot even find out unless you write one other transactions with uncommitted and compare the results, stuff like that. Yeah. But read pass itself does not tell you how many rows you skip. So it's usually only good for single rows single row retrieval. Who has used uh, no lock before? Yeah, about 99% at least. All right. So, um, let me show something about no lock. Um, because the general, what you see in all over the place in forms is like, well, you just read uncommitted data. But as I mentioned, there is more to it. I'm uh, going to show you that one. So, so I have prepared one table in my database called test consistency. It consists of a certain amount of rows. Uh, actually, I can show you how many rows we have. Select star count star from using the right database, always helpful. So we have 30,000 rows right now in this table. It's static, nothing is happening right now. So now I'm gonna start an update in this table. And in the second session, I have a little bit more complicated script. The second session will read this table. Let me put in a new window. It will read the table and it will read it multiple times and it will calculate the differences, how many rows it read against the, the former um, read of the table. So this update in this session will take a while because it's 30,000 rows and I'm updating all the rows in this case. Yeah. 
just one statement and while I'm updating whatever 30 seconds I'm reading all the time and comparing my results. So session number one is starting and number two is reading. So the update is through. Let me stop that one. Actually, sorry, my mistake. I should have turned on text mode. Let me just do it again. Uh, the good thing, I just change it to a unique identifier, so it's gonna be a new one this time. No problem. Always a surprise, huh? Let's see. Nothing coming. Let me run a second update behind. I think it's waiting to for ten differences. Yeah, okay. So now we see something coming in here. Okay. So what I'm printing out here is the rows counted and the differences to the former row. So we have we really do have thirty thousand rows in it. Yeah. Really, you saw it, uh, it's still 30,000 rows, even now after the updates, uh, it doesn't change anything. But a multiple of times we read more rows, 124 rows too much, uh, 152 too much, and in this case even one too less. Now, this demo always shows some different numbers, so it's just an example. Now what I want to show is, the point is here, you really get off the, the base rows. So whatever data is inside the rows that you read multiple times or read to less, of course, is missing in whatever kind of analysis you're doing. Uh, this is what's happening. You don't only have dirty reads, you actually have multiple reads of the same rows. And the reason is because I have an index on it in the background. Uh, it's moving, it's shifting the rows around and there's, there's one scan going on for the base table. Uh, if the update happens, um, let's say row number one or number X is being read, but our reading thread and now gets updated, it jumps ahead in our page order and then we read it again and so on. Now this will happen in this case with multiple rows. This is why we hit them multiple times. So that's the one side to it, yeah, which I urge you to be careful with. The other one is, well, is no log really not honoring any logs at all? Does not care at all? Let me show how it really is. Small demo, one small table, one single row. And I'm gonna run a transaction which deletes this row. That's my current transaction. And I have a session two. In this session I'm going to to ignore this timeout here, we don't need that one. Let's just go straight to no log. So, no log in this case, since we deleted the only row, will show me well, nothing, yeah, because it's in the state of being deleted. Yeah, so far, so good, probably what you expected. So let me roll back. <coughs> So, if you want to get rid of anything, everything in the table, maybe it's more efficient to use the truncate, right? So, let's run a truncate command against the very same table and do again the same select statement with, trunk, uh, with no lock and we are being blocked. How come? Uh, there are again some metadata objects behind and those kind of locks are also honored by no lock. Uh, so, we can actually have blocking situations even with no lock and a chain of blocks because of that. Another example would be if you read build indexes. And I actually have had customers who have had this as a problem. They had index rebuilds at night and then all the reports were being queued up against that and now even other queries were blocked by the no lock queries. Yeah, so it can happen because they're sitting around. 
All right. So we saw some dirty options and some in edge cases uh, useful options like read paste is not for every scenario, also not timeout. There's a totally different option. This has to do with uh, designing our database and this is having the right indexes. So indexing can actually prevent um, the, the problem with being blocked. And of course you still have a lock, but if you have the right indexes for your queries and if you have the right queries, of course, yeah, um, then you may not have to care about the lock. Let me show that. So I'm going to use AdventureWorks 2012 database right now. Uh, it's just about this one certain uh, product here. And this product I'm going to update with a update statement. So now we of course have a block. We can actually even show that block. If you go to the right database and we see you know, key log, page log, key log, and so on. So there is a log going on in our second session. We will try select statement. So select star is waiting, no surprise. Even if we write a little bit more efficient code, let's say we only pick certain columns of this table. Oh. Oh, hold on, what did I do now? I probably did not clean up. <laughs> Great. Um, one second, please. Why well, did I not clean up? Let me roll back my initial statement. Yeah, great. So, sorry. Let's go back to our update statement. Actually, it will look different now. We have the object, the page, the key. Um, hold on. A little bit irritating me. Okay, there was only one transaction. And that guy is gone. Okay. So, update statement. Yeah, there was something more open. Okay, now again our select query being blocked and the efficient, more efficient query also having to wait right now. So what's it waiting for? Well, we have those objects here. So this is what it's waiting for, the keys of this certain index. So there are indexes on the table already, but not the right one for my query. So let me write the rollback here and go a little bit more down. And let's say we know that we actually only use certain uh, columns like color, list price, product line. So how about creating an index who just contains those columns? Uh, for some reason I put product line only in include. Uh, so I see now my indexes have one extra, also a non-clustered index, that's the new one. And I run the same statement again. So if I now run my more efficient query, it will not have to wait yeah, because I actually only show the rows uh, the columns that I have in the index or I designed my index for this query and maybe some other ones. Yeah. If I write lazy code, select star, well, it still has to wait yeah, because it wants every column and cannot use that index. So that's important now, this more efficient piece of code here which goes to my non-clustered index. And the non-clustered index does not have any columns which are being updated, so it doesn't have to be locked and I'm not blocked. All right. All right, lock escalation is what happens when you have uh, multiple locks on the same object, meaning you have many, many single locks on rows, for example, or keys. So the concept behind is that SQL Server wants to save resources. Now, if he has so many logs and so many is, in, is about 5,000, it will not create single key logs. It will create one object log for the table. 
So there are some, some influencers like the current memory and so on. And also you should be aware that escalation only occurs directly from row or key up to the table, uh, also from page to table, but never in a three-step logic like key to page and from page up to table. Yeah, it's from key or page up to the table directly. So let's see how this works and how actually we can also get around that one in certain scenarios. So everything gone there. Log escalation. So I have prepared here a session number two again with a couple of queries which I will run. And in my session number one, I will start a transaction, update a certain amount of rows and show you the logs. So I'm updating 100 rows and I will have, if I would look at the right database, about 100 logs. Actually it's 106 because additional to the key logs, you know, the 100 key logs, we have an object logs and the pages which contain the keys that we have up there uh, in intent exclusive logs. This is why it's 106 logs. Yeah. Not so much yet. Yeah, it's far away from the 5000 level, so no reason to escalate. So let me actually jump here a little bit. Let's say I update in the same transaction I'm still running here and just update the first 4000 rows. Yeah. I'm still in the si inside my transaction. So now I have 4,100 and something logs on the same object, all keys and pages of this table. Uh, so it's getting a lot of logs here and actually querying those DMVs now it also gets a little bit slower. So let's see what up when I update 5,000 rows. I will have uh, 5,195 um, logs, single logs going on. Well, no escalation yet. Let's see. Let's make it 6,000. Well, indeed, and you saw, see, it gets a little bit slower now. You can actually uh, already notice. We have over 6,000 locks going on. So it did not escalate my locking, at least not yet. Yeah. Let me jump up to 7,000. Yeah. Just see what happens. 7,000, well, more logs. Yeah. So no, no log escalation, what's wrong? Let me roll back here. The problem is, well, log escalation happens when a single statement holds more than 5,000 log. But I happen to trick, I make first 1,000 logs, then another 1,000, then 500 and so on. I did not log 5,000 in one time. That's the reason why you did not see a reason to Escalate. So let me start the transaction and go directly to, let's say, 5,000. How many blocks do we have? Oh, over 5,000. Okay. So the 5,000 obviously is not really correct. Yeah? Let me roll back here and again begin transaction and go to 6,050. And this happens to be the limit where it jumps in. This is log escalation now, so it's 6,050. It's not even 6,000. Yeah? It's 6,050 in this table. Yeah? It really depends on the table. So in this table, 6,050 about, maybe 6,040 also. It escalates, you only have one log, and if I now run a query, no matter what kind of query against this table, anything will be blocked. Yeah? Even though I may not want to update uh, a certain role. I, I am updating the first 6,050 and here let's say I only want to have the rows which are bigger than 20,000. Well, I'm still being blocked, yeah? even though I'm not touching those rows because I've escalated to the whole table. Yeah? All right, not so cool, let's say. This is not what we want. One thing you can do is to change Log escalation to partition. Partitioning is good for managing data warehouse systems, yeah, for data loading, staging, and so on. But it is also good, and this is where actually it has a performance benefit, because being blocked means you have to wait and 
So performance impact. It's also good for changing the locking to in, uh, by forcing it to lock only certain partitions. So I'm going to create partition function, partition scheme. Yeah. And as you can see, I'm putting it all in the primary data file group. Yeah, I, I, it's not about performance tuning the I.O. subsystem right now. It's only about tuning the locking behavior for lock escalation. So I'm going to put my clustered index on my partition schema of this table. So if I now look in the table with my partition function, I see the, uh, the amounts of data sitting in the respective partitions. Yeah, and this partition only one row, there is 9,999. I don't mind that. So we have different partitions now. The table is not one big table, it's now different partitions. So if I run the same again, let's say the update in one straight ahead to 6,050, what do I get? When I run this, this statement here, let's say I want the 20,000 up, who thinks I will be blocked? Who thinks I will get the data? And who's sleeping? Just kidding. Okay. So I'm not getting the data. So the ones who did not raise their hand were right. Don't know. Let's see what's going on here. Yeah, must be some blocking, and it's the same blocking as before. Yeah? It has still escalated. So the pure fact that we have a partition now does not change the locking behavior. This is for backwards compatibility, uh, because somebody had always written on some code before, and somebody now put a uh, partitioning behind the table, it may change certain um, things, like the locking behavior, and actually the chances for deadlocks increase. So I have to set it up. Yeah, you can check the lock escalation level right now is still to the table. I have to change it to auto. Uh, lock escalation to auto. So if there is partitioning, it will es escalate to a partition. So let's do it again. Update statement and let me get the, da the data rows above 20,000. Oh. Have I forgotten a transaction somewhere? Probably. Oh, there's some locks. But this is not what I want. Uh, pun? No modification. Yeah, but I suspect I have a I have an open transaction one more than I actually wanted. The schema modification must be the partitioning. Let's see. All back. This is out. So do we have still our partitioning here? Aha. Well, I wrote back the index relation. <laughs> so, so now we have it. The schema is there. It's distributed, okay. I have no open blocks, huh? okay. And now again, the begin transaction, 6050. And reading and, oh, come on. Ah, if, yeah, yeah. If, I change, uh, if I create the index afterwards, I have also to set that. Um, hold on, hold back here. Great. So, just make sure, yeah. Are you still there? No. What the heck? So, class of index on big table. Is there something to roll back? No. Uh, escalation level. Uh, that one, level. yeah, also got button, but. Ah, that's why I keep running it. Okay, so, all right. So let me check the escalation level. Is that one, is that, that's why I rolled back. Okay, yeah. Thanks for the hidden twist on top existing, yeah. So, now. So the attempt, and that's what I want to see, okay? So there are now more locks. We have a hopped lock and an object intent exclusive lock. That's one lock more than before. But this is not the one that I'm caring about. My select can go around that. It's, it's compatible with the IX on the, on the object. We can go ahead and read from the other partitions, not from this partition. So hopped means hop, uh, heap or tree. This stands for the partition. This one partition is being blocked, but not the other ones. Uh, so I can bucketize my table and only being blocked, let's say, in the old data rows or in the new data rows, if this happens to be a fact table, but not everywhere. All right. Time is running. Let me go fast. So, being deadlocked, let me go really quick over here. Who has not seen a deadlock before? Nobody? Good. So this is the graphical representation. Basically, it's two processes, two threads. Yeah? 
being block, uh, blocking each other um, in an unresolvable state. So discovering those up to SQL Server 2008, before that, was only possible with those trace tracks or running a uh, profile or SQL trace. Uh, this was really nasty to read, but since SQL Server 2008, you actually have a much, much more easy way. So this is the old nasty stuff. The better stuff is, I'm sorry, not the right one. The better stuff is to go to directly to the um, system health session of extend events and grab your data there. The data is in the extended events session, which is being running all the time on your server since 2008, and it's being, it captures, amongst other things, all that logs. Yeah. So let me demonstrate this one real quick. Let me create one deadlock, means I have at least one session here, and the other one over there. And one of those will get deadlocked. And if I now go here to management and extended events sessions, I have my system health sessions. And this one, in, the, in behind, I have not set up anything. It's just there. Yeah, I've installed SQL so that's what I did. And if I look in the target data, I will see my deadlock. I should, depends a little bit on the buffering. If it's not there, I will just go here and see if I can pull it out of the ring buffer itself. Deadlock. That's not the right one. No. Obviously, it has not reached this buffer. So there's a buffering going on. Before that, I cannot really see it here in my, uh, in my trace file. Let me run this deadlock again and hope it will exceed the buffer size. But eventually, it will appear in here. So deadlock again. No, not there yet. Come on. <coughs> Pardon? Um, no, it's not lost. No chance. Um, it can happen if I have a big load on the system. Yeah? And it can happen if the deadlock is really, really huge. It means like above 1.75 megabyte the graph, but this is not going on. No, no, it's just the buffer is not being emptied yet. Yeah. To back there is not enough in it, not enough errors. Maybe I also have a filter set up, I don't hope so. Ah, that's helpful. That, XML, that. You all want XML, that, so let's search for that. And there is the deadlock report, only one. Yeah. One made it through, and I can see my deadlock in the system health event session. So what I can do now is actually go and pass the data out. And this is what I showed here in this short preview. I've actually created a free tool, which you can download from CodeBlex. I'm pulling out the data of, out of the extend events session, passing it into a table so you can read it more conveniently and analyze your deadlocks, even including the execution plan, which may have a hint why you are being blocked uh, and being deadlocked. So if I pull out the data into my um, data table, SQL analysis data. I have here the table and I have some other reporting database where I have the views for that. So I can see all the deadlocks which I've collected in the background being pulled into columns and start analyzing from here. So this is what you can do yourself or just go there and grab the code. Yeah? The information is inside the system event session. The only thing extra I did and the only thing I took not uh, from the uh, health session is the query plan. Yeah? I go directly to the DMVs and pull the query plan as long as it's still there. Yeah? So there's some fancy stuff that you can do. So I hope nobody of you, any, of you anymore uses the old trace flags. All right, my time unfortunately is about to be over. So just let me give it one hint about the next uh, level, that would be optimistic concurrency control in SQL Server using snapshot isolation or read committed snapshot isolation. There you don't have blocking. If you don't have blocking, you have also have no deadlocks. 
But of course, it has some cost. Yeah? It goes to TempDB, storing the versions, the previous versions of the rows being uh, changed to return you this data. And the totally last version would be, if you go in memory, you may have heard on that, uh, SQL Server 2014 is also totally lock and also even latch free. So you get the data similar to snapshot isolation levels, uh, which has been there before. All right, so we don't have more time. 60 seconds, uh, six minutes is not so much. I hope it was still useful to you. And if you have some questions, I will still be around. Thank you for your time and see you later.